Top team. So, so when I school boy give me a, this is what the boy wrap up. Wrap up the $20 and the tear money. I'll give me up an LRG and tip out of my car. Run cross here. And by the time I open it so, I'll look funny. That the boy, the school boy give me. But what? Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow is another day making lives still and go on, you know. Uh, $20 and that don't make me less of a man. We just show him up. See, he my teeth still seen. So we can't make any of you pull me out for $20 still seen. Juliet Wallenis decided that she is not going to withdraw her letter. And she is not going to apologize to Miss Curtis. Andrew Wallace did not set the record straight as a man of the yard, as the leader of the house, and let his wife know, say, listen, the best thing to do to move forward is to apologize to this woman because you have, you have done her wrong. And the best thing to do is to apologize to her with the letter and make everybody can move forward in peace. But the man don't even have the balls to do so. Him not have the balls. If say to him one wife say, relax, be humble. Just apologize to Miss Curtis for what you have done to this woman and withdraw the letter publicly. Him not have the balls for do that. Oh, you can't even have the balls to run parliament or run a yard, but you want to run a country. Make that make sense to me, people. Oh, you cannot run a yard. You can't talk to your wife and make your wife know. Say, listen, what well, Jamaica they watch you know? And me already in a, in a, in a enough problem, you know? So just withdraw the statement or the letter. And apologize to her. That not take nothing at all upon you. But them ego. I get the best of them. And I don't know how people. Sit back. Saying these people are doing a good job. When they come in like a big bully. In the eyes of the public. You have a picnic watch them. Big people watch them. Elderly people watch them. And all me see the in them. Is that they are bullies. A bunch of bullies. That's why they can't fire every alarm in town, you know. Because all of them are the same thing. But, bless up to my viewers and my subscribers. Them. Me hope everybody having a blessed and a wonderful evening. Now, my viewers and my subscribers, remember. In everything you do, always put God first. In every, uh, any situation, just always remember to call upon God. Always remember to pray. Because a prayer day... Keep the devil away. Now, my viewers and my subscribers, we have a lot coming up inside this update. So, you definitely don't want to miss it. So, remember, leave a like on this video. Give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. And remember, turn on the post notification bell for new content. Alright? Now, people, make a run the intro and come back. We soon forward. So welcome back to my viewers and my subscribers. Them. Big up to all of my viewers. Big up to all of my subscribers. Them. We continually support the channel and help the channel to grow. Now my viewers and my subscribers, remember to leave a like on this video. Remember to give this video a thumbs up. Also, if you are new viewers, first time on my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and turn on the post notification bell so whenever we drop new content, you will be first to be notified. Share the content with a friend, a family, a loved one. Share it on your social media platform. All right? Now, my viewers and my subscribers, this country that we are living in is uh, surrounded by corruption. And when I say surrounded by corruption, I mean the people in government, the governing party, the prime minister, and his cronies. Now, they recently did a sitting in parliament which involved both sides of the party. 
and they were paying tribute to Miss Valerie Curtis. Now, Andrew Wellness have all of the sweet and nice things them we say about Miss Valerie Curtis along with his wife as well. All of them over the Jamaican Labour Party, I mean all of them, had nothing but to say about Miss Valerie Curtis. But the only problem right now is that none of them as a man over on that side don't have the balls. Them not have the balls, the testicles for be a man and man enough to tell the Speaker of the House to apologize publicly to Miss Curtis because no matter what tribute they might they send out to her, they don't mean it. And Miss Curtis won't accept it because according to what Miss Curtis are saying, she need a public apology from the Speaker of the House and she need to withdraw that letter publicly as well. Now, this woman claims that she don't do nothing wrong. She claims to say she don't do nothing wrong. So, unfortunately, them don't know right from wrong. So, them can't even know if them do nothing wrong. You understand me? I say, no, I don't have nothing against the Speaker of the House more than we want him for... We want her to resign. She need to resign because she no qualify to sit as the speaker of the house. The way she behave, she no qualify to not even sit in the house of parliament. Along with the husband as well. Him no qualify. Because, listen, they claim to say that they are role model to our children. But, to be, to be fact with you all, and for telling you the truth, them claim to say Vibes Cartel are one of the worst things come out of Jamaica because they have bad influence to our children. But the truth is, they are worse than Vibes Cartel because they are the leader of the country and everybody look up to them and they cannot be truthful to these people. Them cannot be truthful to Jamaican. So who is more worse than Vibes Cartel? And as a man I grew up, a big man, we have sons, maybe nephews as well, and all of them male family members. You have to learn to put on your foot and stand up like a man. To me, you don't have the balls to stand up like a man. You more have the balls to send police, go beat anybody we call a name. Too tough. Anybody will tell you about your mother. Anybody will this. Anybody will that. Your St. Paul is going to beat them. But your wife is a speaker of the house. And she keep on a mess around with people. She keep on a big trouble with people. I try to make others look bad. But yet still, you cannot control her. And let you know, say, listen, cut the foolishness. You understand? When you do things, you only make it look bad for my side. Them, them have the balls to do that. So, how can you run a country when you can't even run parliament? How can you run a country when you can't run a yard? How can you run a country when you can't control your own wife? That is a big question. More than like everybody he hawks them because it is a national disgrace it is a national disgrace but people check out some of the tributes them right now madam speaker the house is aware of the retirement of course of our clerk of the house mrs valerie ann Curtis, CD, BHM, JP. Today I pay tribute to our clerk of the house for her outstanding dedication to the Houses of Parliament of Jamaica, giving human service for almost three decades. Before her tenure, Madam Speaker, Ms. Curtis served as an educator, impacting young minds in her hometown of Abuka in St. Anne, 
and later across other educational institutions in Kingston and St. Andrew. Her teaching career and her later role here at Parliament indicated an innate capacity to give herself for the service of others. Ms. Curtis began her career in Parliament in 1995 as an assistant clerk, laying foundations for what would be a distinguished tenure. In 2006, she was promoted to the role of deputy clerk, a position she held for 15 years. Ms. Curtis's leadership skills were especially evident when she served as acting clerk to the Houses in October 2020. Her ability to undertake critical roles during that pivotal period was demonstrative. Following this, she was appointed clerk to the Houses in July 2021, a role she performed with exceptional ability and professionalism. Ms. Curtis operated at the national level, providing sound procedural advice and being a competent administrator and internationally representing the parliament at various conferences and was inst instrumental also in staging international conferences here in Jamaica. During her time at parliament, she also pursued continuous professional development, enhancing her contribution to the institution. She gained a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of Wolverton in 2004, a Certificate of Legal Education from the Norman Manley Law School, and was called to the bar in 2012. And these are testaments to her dedication, I think, to learning and general excellence. Her commitment and exemplary service is always recorded, and we are satisfied that she has served her, the Parliament of Jamaica well, as well as the country of Jamaica in like fashion. She moves on to other avocational pursuits, which we want to wish her the greatest success in those efforts. And may she enjoy a very peaceful and happy retirement. And we will continue, of course, to acknowledge the career that she has had and the source of inspiration that she might have provided for so many people whose lives she has touched. May it please you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I would like to join with the House Leader in welcoming back members from the break and to wish everybody, and especially our staff of this parliament, well. Madam Speaker, the exchanges that the leader of government business and myself as leader of opposition change, um, share from time to time is, is, are done in strict confidence. And if it, that were not so, we wouldn't be able to perform, I think, adequately the functions that we serve. So we do speak, but those discussions are in confidence. And so I don't normally would refer to those discussions. But the leader of government business did advise me that there would be this tribute that we would be seeking to pay for the former clerk of the house. Um, but he noted, I noted, my concern, one, whether or not the clerk would be present, because from time to time we come here and pay tribute to those who have served and those who have passed. So it's on the, the death of a member or a former clerk that we would sometimes rise and pay tribute. I like to pay tribute when people are alive, but better yet, when they are in front of us. So, so, so there was a hint that the former clerk might not be in Jamaica. 
but I believe that it would have been so important, and I'm not too sure what is the duration of her time overseas, but I, I really, as I had indicated, would have preferred if she were present when we are doing this tribute, when we are honoring her for the service that she has given to this parliament and to this country. And uh, I, I note that there was a previous activity that was done with her present. And I'm committing that the opposition will find some time an occasion when she's back to pay like tribute for the work that she has done for this country. The, the leader of government business will also note my deeper concern that the former clerk has departed with this tremendous cloud that exists. And he know that we could not come here today to pay meaningful tribute unless, and sincere tribute, unless that issue is dealt with. And our position has been that it was an unfortunate letter. And we believe that the letter should be withdrawn, but more so, and based on her own words, it was a tremendous embarrassment to her, to her family and friends. And that in addition to the withdrawal of the letter, there should be a public apology offered. So, so while all of us, and I've, I've not heard a single member of this parliament speaking negatively about the work and conduct of the former clerk. And that's why we could not come here and in paying tribute to her, not have her present, but also to have this cloud remaining after such, as you have described, a long and distinguished career in the public sector, and in particular with this parliament. So it is with some regret and sadness that I rise to make these brief remarks. We do hope that, and we are going to try to find an occasion where we can be much more fulsome in our comments to the former clerk in front of her. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I do take note of the opposition leader of government business comments in relation to the preference or presence of the clerk. That indeed was my preference too. But we had conversations around the situation and contact was made and we respect her preferences. So I just want to assure you that her preferences were well regarded on this side prior to my comments. Um, ju just to let you know. But Madam Speaker, um, I believe that there is a further comment that is needed to be made, and I defer to you. Thanks, House Leader. As Speaker, it is my privilege and indeed my duty to acknowledge Ms. Valerie Curtis for her long and dedicated service to this parliament. This journey began when she joined as a staff member of the parliament, assistant clerk in 1995 and continued to work her way to being appointed deputy clerk in 2006. Her commitment to duty saw her being elevated to the position of clerk in the houses in 2021. And since that time, she has commendably led her staff in providing the necessary procedural and administrative support to the members of both houses. During her time at Parliament, Ms. Curtis displayed a commitment to upholding parliamentary ideals, even as she displayed a people-centered approach to parliamentary administration, 
while overseeing several initiatives aimed at improving parliamentary operations. Throughout her tenure, she represented Jamaica at parliamentary conferences across the globe and was integral to the staging of international parliamentary conferences here in Jamaica, as well as hosting a myriad of visiting international delegations to the parliament. Ms. Curtis has been recognized by the government of Jamaica for her contribution to the parliament through the conferment of the badge of honor for meritorious service, as well as the order of distinction in the rank of commander class in 2020 in 2014 and 2020, respectively. Our differences in perspectives on a particular administrative matter and the resulting procedural communication to her, which was never placed on our HR record, but which has unfortunately been circulated in the public domain, was never intended to distract from our years of service and valuable contribution to the parliament. Therefore, it is important for me to state that I continue to hold the retired clerk in high regard and acknowledge her contribution and not allow that to be overshadowed for any reason. The former clerk has left an indelible mark on the parliament and it is our hope that she will enjoy her well-deserved retirement. Madam Speaker, I am humbled and honored to pay tribute to an outstanding public servant, Ms. Value Curtis C.D., one who I find committed and dedicated to her work and went beyond the call of duty to make sure that every member of parliament was comfortable in this house. I came here first in 1980, and I met the greatest clerk of the house, that was Edley Dean. And the knowledge that I have acquired as it relates to parliamentary procedures and the standing order, I learned that from Edley Dean, who I believe was the greatest clerk that this house has seen. I will not hesitate to say I believe Valerie Curtis can be compared to Edley Deans in her work, her standard, and her professionalism. I want to thank her for the service she has given to Jamaica and to this house. I want to say I'm confident that it will be difficult for anyone coming after her to fill her shoes and to be as outstanding and as great a clerk as she was. I do hope that after her, the staff and all around will enjoy that type of camaraderie, respect for each other, and a good working atmosphere. I want to say Thanks to her for that great service she gave. And I hope that others would try to emulate her so that they can do as good a job or a closer job as Valid Curtis did to this house and this country. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to pay tribute and to acknowledge the work of our former clerk, retired clerk of the House, Valerie Curtis. Uh, when I entered the House as a well, younger parliamentarian, younger parliamentarian, I found Mrs. Curtis to be a valuable resource. As all members will agree, those on that side, those on this side, and those who may choose to speak, as well as those who 
would not speak. I'm sure there is general agreement that when you enter this house, you are lost. You are entering a world that is very complicated. Procedures and conventions for which you can only learn by experience. And it is indispensable that you, ha that you have the staff of parliament, particularly the clerk and her assistant and deputy, who are able to guide and, I dare say, protect you. And I found that in Valerie Curtis, our retired clerk. I had occasion to travel with her on parliamentary conferences. One readily comes to mind in the Cayman Islands. And uh, I found her there to be very knowledgeable on parliamentary practice and procedures. And I relied on her as a young parliament here. And I, should, I would have had to make a presentation. And uh, I remember working with her the night before to complete my presentation. And she was very helpful. And I am indeed very grateful for the assistance she gave in helping me to prepare my presentation, which, by the way, was well received and went very well. Yes. And, and I'm here saying I'm very grateful for her assistance as I'm sure she would have helped you as well. And I hope you express your gratitude to her. Yes. I also recall on many occasions, Madam Speaker, members, when I served as leader of government business in this house. And again, Valerie, forgive me for being on uh, familiar terms, the, our retired clerk, was again an indispensable and invaluable resource in ensuring that the order of the house, in terms of its business and procedures, was well maintained. And uh, those were some difficult times, Madam Speaker. And uh, what I can say about our retired clerk's disposition is that she was always patient. Uh, she was always very respectful and showed, I think, extreme deference to the members of the House. And that helped because you did not have to worry, Madam Speaker, about the usual considerations of ego and uh, sensitivities when you have to make tough decisions or you need to get to the point to make decisions. So if you were to ask the former clerk for advice, or ask her for some documentation or some support, and uh, for any reason, you would say, I need this urgently, or I need this now. You would not have to worry about any offense being taken, because she understood the environment in which we operated and made herself available to provide the support as needed. And so I had a good working relationship with her as leader of government business in the House for a few years. As Prime Minister, again, I found her to be quite helpful and, again, an invaluable resource to ensure that the front bench and the various 
leaders of government business that I would have appointed, that they were able to execute their job in an efe efficient and effective manner. On our elevation to the post of Clark, I thought it was well deserved. Clearly, she has served this house well. She lifted herself by gaining knowledge and experience, by getting that knowledge and experience certified, and by her works. And her appointment, I am sure, by all members, was welcome without any reservation. Madam Speaker, you have mentioned that there is a particular administrative matter which has made its way into the public domain and which would have cast a certain unfortunate shadow on a career that has well served this parliament. Madam Speaker, I note your statements regarding your own respect and acknowledgement of the service of our former clerk. I note the statement made by the leader of opposition business. We join in saying that we too would want her to be here to receive our tributes in person. And you will recall that a few weeks ago, the issue was raised as to whether or not we would do our traditional tribute as we would for any other speaker. And at that time, I stood and said, most definitely, that would be the case. And in keeping with that commitment, we now rise to our feet to pay tribute. I agree that there should be a, another event where we are able to speak directly to the former clerk. And I would ask the leader of government business to collaborate with the leader of opposition business to ensure that that uh, special event can be arranged and that the entire parliament uh, members and staff could uh, have that um, done at, in short order as well, as soon as the clerk is available. In closing, my tribute to the speaker, Madam Speaker, my tribute to the clerk, Madam Speaker. The clerk has given humans service. Nobody questions that. And I think all of us have a personal connection and relation with the, with the clerk. I certainly do. I've known her for more than 20 odd years. And I think we can all agree that uh, what has transpired in the public domain is indeed uh, unfortunate. I would say, however, that in the course of professional relationships, there will inevitably be differences in perspectives. There will inevitably be administrative and procedural differences. But as the speaker said, when it comes to assessing the overall contribution of the individual, when it comes to assessing, and nobody can question that, the commitment of the individual, the contribution of the individual, that we must be fulsome, that we must be forthright. And as our former clerk retires and moves on to other things. We wish her well, and she should know 
that she has the respect, love, and admiration of the Parliament of Jamaica, which she served unreservedly. Thank Madam Speaker, may it please you. Thanks, Prime Minister. It would be remiss of me, I was not here to welcome the current clerk. Um, let me take this opportunity to welcome Ms. Lowe, Ms. Colleen Lowe, our current clerk, whom has been working alongside our former clerk and myself for, in respect of former clerk, approximately a year or more, and in respect of my own interactions with her for the last five months. I wish you all the best in your administration of the back office of parliament, which many persons have very limited appreciation for the work there and for your procedural execution in the House of Parliament and particularly this, the lower house and the Senate for which you are going to be responsible. Welcome, Madam Lowe. I wish you all the best. House Leader. Uh, Madam Speaker, I too would like to enjoy you in welcoming our new clerk. And I was not uh, here myself when she began her tenure, um, but I learned of it with uh, much satisfaction and delight, in fact, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, we want to formally indicate her presence with us, and to do that, you will allow me to read uh, this particular piece, which I normally don't do, but because I could have spoken of her, because we've worked very closely in the last year, and she's been of enormous help to us in so many ways. The Houses of Parliament of Jamaica which is to announce that Governor General, His Excellency Sir Patrick Allen, has appointed Attorney at Law and Deputy Clerk Colleen Lowe as the new clerk of the houses. Ms. Lowe's appointment takes effect on Monday, April 18, 2024. Ms. Lowe replaces Ms. Valerie Lowe, um, Curtis, who served the parliament for almost three decades in various capacities and proceeded on retirement effective April 6, 2024. Ms. Lowe brings a wealth of legal experience and expertise to the esteemed role of providing high-level support to the functioning of the Houses of Parliament and upholding the high standards of parliamentary procedure. Ms. Lowe pursued her law degree, LLB, at the University of Hertfordshire and the Bar Professional Training course at the BPP Law School in the United Kingdom. She was called to the United Kingdom Bar Association at Lincoln's Inn Fields in March 2012 and the Jamaican Bar in July 2014. She holds a certificate of legal education from the Norman Manley Law School. She is also the holder of a Master's of Business Administration degree from the University of Suffolk in the United Kingdom. She is also a certified mediator in both the UK and Jamaica. Ms. Lowe is a graduate of Glenmere High School in Clarendon. During her professional career in Jamaica, Ms. Lowe worked at Lopez and Lopez Attorney at Law and the National Land Agency. Ms. Lowe also worked at the Electoral Commission of Jamaica as a legal officer before she took up the role in the Houses of Parliament as Deputy Clerk in May 2022. We welcome her and we welcome the breadth of her experience and knowledge and we look forward to working with her as together we strengthen not just the administration of this great house, but we also enable the practice of democracy as we understand it to be at the highest level under her guidance. May it please you, Madam Speaker. Minister Bartlett, there is uh, one minor Would you like to? 
go, she actually commenced her tenure on April 8, not 18. Thanks, House Leader. Leader of Opposition Business. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I would like to join in welcoming formally the new clerk to this parliament. We have seen her already at work. Very pleasant and already showing the capability that our previous, all our previous clerks have shown. So we want to welcome her, want to wish her all the best at this time and uh, indeed the entire staff that she will be managing. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Statement by Ministers. House Leader. Madam Speaker, in the last week or so, this nation lost two really outstanding members of our community, two very powerful ladies who have served in various capacities. One, in fact, was a member of this honorable house and, in fact, a member of the upper house as well. I speak in the particular instance, Madam Speaker, of uh, Miss Princess May Laws, who served the Parliament of Jamaica from 1977 to 1989. Miss Laws, our princess, as we always call her, started her political career in the Senate in 1977 and served for one term in that place. She then became a member of parliament for the House of Representatives, representing the constituency of St. Anne Northwestern in 1980 until she left the House of Representatives in 1989. And I had the uh, honor, Madam Speaker, of being in this honorable house when she became a member in 1980. I, I do recognize that. And, uh, it's, it's to your pain that you missed that opportunity. <laughs> but it was an interesting period in our history. 1980 was a renaissance period in Jamaica's history for so many reasons. Indeed, Madam Speaker, deliverance did come in 1980. <laughs> During her tenure at Parliament, Madam Speaker, Ms. Law served as Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Youth and Community Development, focusing on women's affairs and children's services. Ms. Laws also had the distinction of serving as the president of the Inter-American Commission of Women, the SIM, and she was committed, Madam Speaker, to ensuring the participation of women at all levels. That felt also, Madam Speaker, that she had the responsibility at the time, as she puts it, to ensure that we would never neglect the development and full utilization of 50% of our most productive resources, our women. And Madam Speaker, I can speak of a particular instance with Princess Laws that might uh, tickle your memories, some of you, a little bit. Because the work that Princess Laws did in building the institutions for um, gender affairs as we have it today, at that time we called it women's affairs, um, was seminal. And she followed, of course, the good work of people like Peggy Antrobus and a number of others of that era who, along with Beverly Manley, started that whole process of thought leadership in the area of gender activities, with particular reference to women's affairs. <clears throat> and she worked assiduously to craft 
part of what became the United Nations Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And I recall very well, because I was the Minister of Youth and Community Development then, with responsibilities for women's affairs. And it turned out that in 1984, when the conference was held in Nairobi, and there was a big discussion as to who should represent Jamaica, because it's a ministerial conference. And at the time, Princess was no longer the parliamentary secretary in the Ministry of Youth, and um, she was a member of parliament. And there was a big discussion as to whether a male minister should represent the women at a women's conference in Nairobi. Of course, I had no difficulty saying absolutely not. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing is that Princess, in fact, deferred to um, Senator Jeanette Grant Woodham, who was then president of the Senate and was the most senior woman in our administration at the time. And she went and delivered my statement to the conference. Madam Speaker, um, Ms. Laws, was in fact the first female member of parliament, but also the first JLP member of parliament for Northwestern St. Anne. And she defeated our good friend Arnold Bertram at the time and did a marvelous job for Jamaica. The result of that, of course, is that she led the way for now that constituency having a nice, brighter color. <laughs> uh, Madam Speaker, she, she served her country well, and she didn't confine her service to Parliament. And I don't want to steal the thunder of any other speaker who may want to speak about her in relation to her service to her church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which she was a cornerstone of in the parish of St. Anne, and of course, the Jamaica Union itself, which beyond Jamaica extended into the West Indies. Madam Speaker, today we recall her with great affection. But we recall her as a strong woman who worked very hard, who was diligent in her efforts, and was made a sterling contribution to the development of Jamaica and our children because of the role she played when she had responsibility for children's services in the Ministry of Youth. May her soul rest in peace and light perpetual shine on her. Madam Speaker, I refer also to another lady of great distinction. Um, she is also the mother of one of our ministers, the Minister of Science and Technology and Transportation. And also, she was the widow of a former minister of this um, country, Minister of Industry and Commerce, the Honorable, then Honorable Douglas Vaz. Mrs. Sonia Vaz, an outstanding woman, a fashion designer who made a whole difference in the area of making a special uh, female uh, apparel. And, um, and there was a great story that we had about about um, Douglas Vaz then and what he produced because he was a great manufacturer, uh, a textile manufacturer. <laughs> and they focused on a very sensitive areas of human apparel. And, um, and, um, and I tell you, they made a huge contribution to this country. And, and I want this house to record her as an outstanding mother, an outstanding wife, and an outstanding member of the society. May her soul rest in peace and light perpetual shine on her. And Madam Speaker, we would ask, as uh, in the case of uh, Princess Laws, that the appropriate letter be sent to her family, that a similar one be done to um, the vases, um, her three sons, um, who, who we know very well, and of course, her daughter-in-law, who is in this house, and Marie Vaz. Uh, may it please you, Madam Speaker. Thanks, House Leader.
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise as well to add our few words of sympathy and appreciation for the life and the work of Miss Princess Laws. As with profound sadness, we too learned of her passing. We acknowledge her as the first member of parliament, as was said earlier, for Northwest St. Anne. Oops. For Northwest St. Anne. She really has left a void not only in the political landscape, but also in the hearts of those who knew her and benefited from her dedicated service. Princess Laws, as was said earlier, broke many barriers. And uh, she made history throughout her career. She exemplified compassion and a unwavering dedication to the people she served. Her advocacy, as was said earlier, for women, children, and the marginalized resonated deeply with many. Beyond her political achievements, she also served with distinction, as was said as well, within the Jamaica Union Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, leaving also an indelible mark on the organization and its mission. As we mourn her passing, we too extend our condolences to her family, friends, and colleagues. May they find solace in cherished memories and the knowledge that her legacy will endure as a beacon of inspiration for generations to come. I would also want, as I am already on my feet, to also recognize the passing too of Mrs. Sonia Vaz, um, who is mother of one of our own member and colleague. As we toil in the political vineyard, we know just how important family is to us. As uh, importantly, when others uh, are buffeting you from left to right, it is uh, to family that we go for comfort, for solace, and uh, for buttressing us as individuals and as human beings. So to the family, we extend our condolences. And uh, we ask that uh, we all bear the family up in prayers as you are comforted by your memories of her. Blessings. Thanks, thanks to the member from St. Andrew Southwest. Next, how, um, opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. In addition to the tributes that have been paid already to um, Miss Princess Laws and uh, um, Mrs. Sonia Vaz, which I fully endorse, I, I want to bring to this House's attention the fact that our colleague from North Central St. Catherine, the Deputy Leader of Opposition Business, has lost her daughter. Madam Speaker, this is really quite tragic for her, and uh, I think at this time it is appropriate for the, the House to send uh, its sympathies to the member on this tragic loss and to wish her well in this time of bereavement and that we will all pray for her so that the grief which at this time is tremendous can subside within a reasonable time. So we ask for special blessings and prayers for our colleague in North Central St. Catherine. Madam Speaker, we on this side fully concur with, with that sentiment. Um, indeed, I reached out to the member. Um, I sent her a note myself. Um, I wasn't sure how, but I'm very happy that you have raised it so that we can enjoin you in extending our sympathies and to tell her that our hearts are with us in this difficult hour. Our prayers are there for her and our support is there for her. We love and respect her. And Madam Speaker, I can relate to that because I went through that. I lost my daughter at a time when, believe me, and it pained. I've, my family and I have not gotten over it. 
So Natalie, I understand, we understand, and we grieve with you. May her soul rest in peace and light perpetual shine on her also. Madam Speaker, I want to join in conveying sympathies and condolences to the family of former colleague of this house, Miss Princess Laws. As, as the leader of government business would have indicated, her tenure started before everyone else except his. And so we never had the opportunity to, to, to share with her. But she served this house and for an extended period of time. And against that background, we want to really express sympathies to her family who will have to deal with her passing. The mother of our colleague, as the member from Southwest, St. Andrew indicate. In our political journey and out of the limelight of the activity, activities is our family who provide that unseen support that keep us going. I can imagine what the member from West Portland is going through now and his family at this time of her passing. It's one of those experiences that you can never adequately express in words, no matter how much you may try. And I just want to join in conveying to the member and his family that they don't stand alone during this period um, of grave bereavement. For a colleague from North Central St. Catherine, whose daughter suddenly passed yesterday, um, we all, as parents, expect our children to bury us, for them to live longer than us, but never for us to have to deal with their passing. And as a parent too, I can't begin to imagine what she's going through. I cannot. I tried to reach her. I didn't. And the truth is, if I had reached her, I just never know what I would say. I really just don't know what I would say. But Natalie's grief has been compounded because a very, 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 very close friend and political confidant and all of us in this house know and understand how dear and critical certain individuals are to our political journey of a political organization. But Ricardo James was more than just a political confidant. He was a personal best friend of hers and her family. She did nothing organizationally without him. She indeed has been central in supporting his family, dealing with the grief. And the gentleman lost his brother the same day. And she has to be carrying those burden just over the past couple of weeks, couple of weeks, and now her daughter. I happen to know that her daughter has been so dear to her so dear to her. And yes, House Leader, as you said, you, I recall very well the period when you went through that experience and saw from a distance what you endured 
for so long, and as you said, you're still going through it. And we can understand that. It is in these, these times that we really need to stand with each other as we travel this unfortunate journey. May her soul rest in peace, our former colleague, Mrs. Vaz, and the daughter of our colleague, Natalie Garvey. I thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Let me thank the Minister for the statement and the um, report that she has uh, tabled and that she has given. Um, as she started, I also wanted to um, just say a few words as well about the situation at Irwin High and um, just the tragedy that that is for both parents, families, as well as the school family and the community um, family. When we have 14, 15 year olds being involved in such activities at school, um, it really is uh, something that we can't just pass. We have to stop and look at what it means and what it says. Um, in fact, it wouldn't be the first incident of its kind that we would come here and also talk about, which is also another issue that we need to look at to see how, as a country, we create a different environment that allows our children in schools to act like children and to understand that violence has no place in resolving their issues. So I, I, I know that. Um, I'm looking at all the other stuff, Minister, and I thought you also would have um, included some remarks in, in, in what you are saying in relation to the JTA's announcement of commissioning a, um, an investigation in the number of our educators and, education, educate, and administrators who have just suddenly died. Um, you know, between January and, and March this year, I think 10 um, of them have died. And it is something that um, is becoming more and more of an alarming situation. Um, to many individuals. So I, I just point that out as well, um, especially because um, education can be such a stressful environment, yes? And we want to make sure that if there is anything that can be done, that it is in fact done. But to the report itself, Minister, I, I thank you um, for it. I know that there is a member of the opposition that serves on um, the, on the ETOC um, and has been participating in the discussions that are ongoing. The question that was asked earlier as it relates to the report was simply because you had noted that today a report is tabled. In looking, we didn't see, but it is actually um, the one-year report, which is Transforming Education for National Development, which is actually on the list of um, documents to be tabled today. So um, we have no um, challenge there. We note, um, Minister, that it is uh, um, an eight-year journey in terms of the implementation of um, the recommendations. And we also note that it is divided in um, short-term, um, medium, long-term. And so we welcome that. I, I do believe that we need, outside of the, re the reports, um, periodic reports, the press conferences, to actually have a national dialogue, yes, as we move to transform education. And we have to find a way to move it from just these, uh, the press, one off press conference or uh, that kind of that discussion to a dialogue that engages all of the society. Because it has been one of those things across administration administrations that we have been unable to lift our education, um, uh, certainly the output from where it currently is, and the success of Jamaica, the prosperity, and I, I use that word um, deliberately 
because I've ceded it to no one and to no party. We want a prosperous Jamaica for the prosperity that we seek. It requires a different approach to education and it certainly requires a different output in terms of um, the education that we um, engage. So it is something that I would want to see how we have that national dialogue um, so that we can do that. Minister, I've seen the philosophy of education. As you would understand, it is very difficult to give any in-depth um, comment just reading your um, statement and responding at the same time. I do note, though, and um, would like to say that Members' time for speaking has expired. Madam Speaker, the, the members' time having been expired and in keeping with the tradition, I will offer, she, she wants two minutes to complete her presentation. May it please you, Madam Speaker. Question is that the member be allowed two minutes to complete her contribution. Those in favor, those against, the ayes have it. Uh, thank you, um, colleagues. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. Uh, so I just wanted to say that we are, in fact, pleased that the philosophy that we are espousing embraces diverse learning capacities and styles and so on. Of course, that comes with the requirement of resources to be able to accommodate that. Um, I also, um, the, one, the one thing that I would have wanted to see in the philosophy is a commitment to lifelong learning, yeah? Especially given the, um, the deficiencies in our system and the importance of second chances to individuals who would have not ended their um, academic journey with the kind of education that we would want um, to see. Um, outside, of, outside of that, uh, Minister, we welcome that. I would imagine that the opposition is going to take a proper um, read of the reports to date and also engage in that discussion because education, we are clear, is the foundation on which the kind of society that we want is going to rest and the prosperity that we would want to see. Thank you. Member from St. Catherine Eastern. Um, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to join in as well to express my condolences to the parent of Erin High, and not just to Erin High, but also to the number of schools that are now faced with so much challenges in terms of how to manage these education institutions. I want to thank your minister and just to ask, I heard you in your presentation. In your presentation, um, in your presentation in respect to opening the debate, I'm wondering if you're opening the debate today or you're going to give it some more time in order that we'll be able. You will give some more time. I'm very happy to hear that. Um, Minister, in light, of what, in light of what is happening now in our education system, and I am certain you understand that there's a crisis, that eight years period that I'm looking at in terms of the transformation being done, I'm wondering if we could get some more specifics in terms of the breakout. What will be in year one or year two in order that, you know, we could get a better sense of how we would be able to debate. Because since it's an eight year period, it's really long. And in my view, nothing is wrong with the length of time, but for the period of time over the years that we have been looking at transforming education, by now, we should have enough material to be able to start doing some serious implementation. Um, I'm also concerned in terms of how do we fit community development in terms of this transformation. 
it is going to play a very critical role because to transform education, you have to transform communities as well. And I'm hoping that that will be taken into consideration. In terms of transportation, it might sound foolish, but when we reach to the point where we will be able to have a proper discussion, you will recognize the importance of transporting students to school in a very, very decent way that it will help to transform education. Because it's not about just chalk and board and about curriculum. It's about attitude and behavior. And therefore, I look forward for that debate. And I would love to be able to participate because I am very concerned about education because that is the only vehicle that can remove us from poverty to prosperity. Madam, Madam Speaker, it stands to reason that this am amendment to the schedule of the legislation dealing with intercepts should be amended to add to it the provisions that are being added here in relation to firearms offenses. I assume the minister didn't say it, I don't think, but I assume that the, the schedule previously had the Firearms Act in it. Under the old title, it had it. So essentially, this is just, um, as it were, bringing current that list to reflect the current legislation as opposed to the legislation that existed up until last year. So it's uncontroversial and has our support. Madam Speaker, I wanted to just um, make a few um, comments in relation to the statement made by the Minister and the um, amendment that is before us, um, if, if I'm allowed. So um, one, you, you know it would be remiss of me not to once again, Minister, speak about how important it is for the Minimum Wage Advisory Commission to really be part of the discussion and other stakeholders. Um, in setting the minimum wage. We agree with, we accept, we welcome the increase, but we also believe that the process is important and having that kind of stakeholder dialogue is certainly um, important. I also want to say, Minister, that more and more countries are moving from minimum wage to look at livable wage, and I believe it is time as a country for us to begin to look at that as well. The last time I mentioned something about a domestic helper in Parliament, there were some of my colleagues on the other side who went on their political platform to make a joke and fun about it, saying that I was talking about my own domestic helper. I'm not going to allow that from preventing me from standing up and talking about what is happening in our household helpers community. And so, Minister, I want to place on the table because you did not raise it. But when I speak to domestic helpers, one of the questions they ask is how to deal with issues where they are paid minimum wage, but things like meals and accommodation are also subtracted. And I'd like to hear your comments on that. Um, as it relates to the security guards, Minister, I think we have to go beyond lip service when we talk about um, upholding principles of fairness, economic stability, and so on. And I believe that the government has not done well by the security guards in the way they could in making sure that breaches and excesses are not still continuing, in particular as they moved from where they were before to be considered as workers and with the gap that is still left unattended by many.